Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you today. It's Christmas, the holiday season. Nothing could be brighter and better. All the lights and everything going on. But how do we really understand Christmas? Is there a path to understand the meaning of Christmas without giving up the joys of uh, holiday traditions and whatever? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to look at Matthew 1 and Luke 1 and 2 and uh, see something about uh, how we can uh, fathom Christmas in all that's going on around us. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, that from old, from ancient times, his birth was predicted, prophesied, and it came to be, came to pass in a place we call the Holy Land in Israel. And may we understand it, Father, as we never have before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, with Christmas, it's just a, uh, I call it a frenetic time. It's one of those times where you're just uh, uber busy. You know, you're just running from pillar to post, trying to get presents and go to the parties and decide which things to do and can I take off and will I have any time off and are we going to travel or are we not going to travel? And you put all that together and mix it up and you can, you can really lose sight of what really uh, Christmas is. And, uh, you know, you hear this all the time. People say, we need to return to the meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas. And I always want to say to that person, well, what do you think that is? Uh, what, 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 in your opinion, is the true meaning of Christmas? Because if you ask different people, they'll say something like, well, it's a time of family and love and presents and giving and reflection and whatever else. And uh, that's something we do at Christmas, but that's certainly not the true meaning of Christmas. So what I want to do for us uh, today is look at the names of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and then in Luke chapter 1 and 2 and see if we can fathom the meaning of Christmas. What does it mean, this child, Jesus Christ, who came into the world? And so we'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 1 first. And if you'll remember, Joseph discovers that his espoused uh, Mary is uh, pregnant. And he knows it's not him, and he's certainly wondering who it is. And an angel comes to clarify uh, that situation. Let me read in verse 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he consider this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. If you read Matthew chapter 1 and 2, you'll find out Joseph was a dreamer. He had four dreams in this Christmas story, and every one was significant. And anyway, he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife. For that which has been conceived, that's interesting, uh, has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the conception, uh, she was passive in it. It, she, it, uh, it what has been conceived, and so there's no other uh, human agency in that. The Holy Spirit made this possible. And he says, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. And uh, then he goes on to say some other things. I, I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. But he says, Now all this took place that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, fulfilled, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. So Jesus, and then Emmanuel, and uh, then we have, uh, he's the son of Mary. Uh, he's called the son of Mary. And he's the king of the Jews, on and on in chapter 2. Uh, so let, let me just give a list in Matthew 1 and 2 of what his names are. First of all, he's called Jesus because he's going to save people from his sin. Jesus is the Christ. He will save his people from their sins. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the son of Mary. He's the king of the Jews. And uh, he, he's called my son, God's only son. Isn't that interesting? And then in Luke chapter 1, we he, find out that he's the son of the Most High, He's David's son. And in chapter 2, we realize he's called the Savior, Christ the Lord, and the Lord Christ. And then he's also called a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Well, let's just take a few of those names. The meaning of Christmas starts with the meaning of the word Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Out of the Old Testament, the prophecy of Isaiah, we find out that Emmanuel, God's going to be with us. He's going to be called Emmanuel. That's all it means. God's going to come to be with us. 
John writes in the Gospel of John, he said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the picture of Emmanuel. For a season, Jesus came, born of the Virgin Mary, and then lived as a man, like you and me, lived as a human being, and he tabernacled, he dwelt among us for a season before he died on the cross and was resurrected and then ascended back to the Father victoriously in heaven. But Emmanuel, God with us, God as a man, that means Jesus came to share in every element of human existence except for one, that's sin. Everything that we go through, every experience that we go through, Jesus came to experience in order that he might reveal the Father to us. Now, you know, if we believe that uh, the Word of God just kind of fell out of the heavens or just came, uh, you know, under a rock or in some tablets or something, uh, it might be a little hard to believe that God would understand who we are. But Jesus, who's the Son of God, the very God of God and man of man, came to earth in order that he might reveal God to us, a person revealing to persons who God is. Not only who he is, but what his intentions are, what his purposes are, what creation means, what our lives mean, what, what purpose do we have in life. Well, if we just were trying to always hear from heaven or having to do some sacrifice on a mountain or you know, in the backyard somewhere, we might never, we, we, in fact, we could never have any assurance that we knew God, that we were pleasing God, that we were living for him in the right way. But Jesus came when we could not get to God because of our sin and separation from him. Jesus came from heaven to reveal God to us and, and, and to live for us and to die for us and, and to reveal to us God's purposes and God's truth. And that all comes personally. Jesus said, I'm the way, truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except by me. That's not in a dictum. That's not just written down on a piece of paper or in a religious book somewhere. That's a person speaking to persons. His first sermon in the Gospel of Mark, he comes and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, God's revealing his kingdom through me. That's what he was saying. And we find out what the kingdom of God is all about and what the will of God is through the life of Jesus Christ. The will of God uh, extends uh, far beyond our comprehension or our need to know. But it, but it at least includes what is the purpose of life. Your purpose in life and my purpose in life is to have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ and to enjoy that relationship for eternity. To, to know the one who created us the one who, who came to die for us and to, and to be resurrected so he might forgive us of our sins and bridge that gap, bring us to the Father, the one who gives us life eternal and life abundant. That, that's our purpose in life is to know God and in knowing God, fulfill any purpose he has as he works, watch this now, through our lives to accomplish his purposes. And without Jesus coming, without Emmanuel being with us, and so when Jesus went back to heaven, did we lose Emmanuel? Of course not, because the Spirit of Christ now lives within us. It was the prayer of Jesus. He said, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit, the other comforter, and he's going to be with you forever. When we receive Jesus Christ, the gift of God's grace, when the gospel comes to us, and by faith we accept it, then we immediately receive the gift and the presence forever of the Holy Spirit. God with us forever. Not around us, but in us. Christ in you, Paul writes, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ has come to live before mankind while he was on earth, and now he lives within us right now. It reminds me of the little boy, you may have heard me t tell this story, who went to the doctor, and the doctor was listening to his heart, and the little boy said, do you, uh, do you hear Jesus or see Jesus in there? He was looking at an x-ray, looking, x looking at his heart, uh, listening to his heart. And uh, the doctor kind of chuckled and said, uh, well, well, no, I, I, I don't see him in there. As he looked at the x-ray and listened to his heart. And the little boy said very, uh, very simply, well, you need to look again because he's in there. You see, when you're a believer, Jesus is in here, in our lives, in our spirits. 
uh, always attending to our mind, will, and our emotions, our bodies, and whatever else. So that's important. So to understand Christmas, we have to understand the great love of God that said, these people in sin, these people are under my wrath, and I'm going to send my love in the form of Jesus Christ, my only begotten Son, and he's going to reveal me. The Father says, I want the, I want the world to know who I am. And the only way they can know that is through the person and the life of ministry. And then he was given the name Jesus. In the Old Testament, that word is Joshua. And it means he, uh, Jehovah saves. Jesus is to save us from our sins. So he came not only to reveal the Father, but he came also to do a specific thing that makes all the difference now and forever. And that is to save us from our sins. We had to be ransomed. We, have to be, we had to be redeemed. We had to be delivered because we were in a position falling short of the glory of God where we could never get back to God on our own. One sin would do it. And in my life and your life, there are multiple sins. And God knew this while we were helpless. While we were helpless, God sent his son Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and to be resurrected. And so Jesus means that his whole life was focused and continues to be focused on saving people from their sins. Jesus saved me from my sins when I received him by faith as a little boy. And he continues to save me from our sins as he's our intercessor before God and our advocate before the Father. He was the sacrifice and the priest at the same time for our sins forever. And he's always interceding for us. His blood continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then he's Christ. What does that mean? It means he's the Messiah. Christ is just a, uh, the, the New Testament word for the Old Testament word, Messiah. He's Christ, he's the prophet, he's the priest, he's the king. He's the Messiah to deliver his people, to lead his people to rule over his people. He has come to rule over us. He's the one who completes all we need from the Father. All we need and all the Father requires, our Messiah has come to meet those demands. God's demands did not lessen because uh, we were sinners. His demands are consistent. God is consistent in all of his nature. And in righteousness, he comes against with wrath and power and judgment. But Jesus Christ, the Messiah, comes to meet every demand that the wrath and the power and the judgment of God would play, be placed upon us. He's also our shepherd, prophet, priest, and king. He's the living word to be the prophet of God. He's the priest who always makes intercession for us, uh, standing before God, if you will, pleading our case by his blood. And he's also the king who rules over all but he's also the shepherd. That's what Messiah means. The shepherd who protects us and who provides for us in our every need. He's the one who leads us, leads us by his word, leads us by the spirit, leads us by his word. In prayer, we find it. In reading the Bible, we find it. And we find the will of God expressed in the word of God so we can walk in the way of God. That is so significant and important. He's the Lord of all things. Jesus Christ the Lord. Christ Jesus the Lord. What does that mean? He's the absolute ruler of all things in heaven and in earth. There's nothing that's not under his powerful reign and rule. On earth, he has the right to rule because he overcame sin and the devil and the world. He has the right to rule because the Father has given him that right on the basis of his resurrection and his ascension. And so Christmas, as we look at Christ and focus upon Christ, is all about these things. Emmanuel, Jesus, Christ, Lord, oh, all of that. So he's worthy, is he not, of worship and thanksgiving. So we surrender to him as Lord and Master. But so many, so many of these titles we have. I like this, Son of the Most High. He was fully God. And he was fully, he, he is fully God and fully man. And those natures uh, are, are in one body, but they don't mix. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not that. A human being is never become, going to become God. Uh, it's just not possible for that. But he's that. He's the king of the Jews. 
shepherd of our hearts, the son of the Most High. He's David's son. He was born in the lineage of David. Why? David's the king. And it was promised to David that he would have a ruler on his throne forever. And that ruler happens to be the son of David. That's none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Christ. What does that mean? That means that God the Father has placed upon him the moniker of Messiah. He's placed upon him the rule of Messiah. He's placed upon him the reign of Messiah. He's a light of revelation to the Gentiles. You know, the Lord had been working through the Jews for centuries. And yet always, Israel was to be a light for the nations who would see the blessings of God upon that nation and they would come to the Lord. Well, of course, they didn't fulfill that, but Jesus fulfills it. He's the light of the world. He claimed that for himself. He said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the resurrection in the life. I'm the living water. He said so many things that we need. He didn't say that to say, look at me. He said that to say, come to me. Come unto me, all you weak and heavy laden. You're weary, you're tired. You're tired of fighting the life that you have that doesn't get you anywhere and removes you further and further from God and the purposes of God for your life. So you come to me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the revelation of God. I'm the light of the world for every person, Jew and Gentile alike, a light of revelation. He's the very glory of Israel. But now, having thought about that, you know, when Jesus came into this world, he caused some trouble. Yeah, I've preached a message before entitled, That Boy's Trouble. Think about the trouble he causes in the world. You know, he's the only uh, founder of a religion that invites people to come to him so that he can come into them and give them his life. Other founders of religion, great scholars and teachers and moralists and, you know, whatever else, but only Jesus said, I've come to die for you. No other founder of religion ever died for his people. And he said, I'm, I'm dying for you because I'm taking your sins personally on me and I'm going to bear them on the cross and when I'm resurrected, I can forgive you of all sin and give you my righteousness to replace your unrighteousness. He causes trouble. Think about it. He caused trouble with his father, Joseph. <laughs> he did. Joseph had got to marry this uh, virgin, now pregnant uh, woman uh, that he's engaged to. That's trouble. He caused trouble for Mary. Talk about trouble. You know, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And she said, uh, well, you know, I'm a virgin and I intend to stay a virgin. And he said, no, it's going to be all right. This is of God. Calls trouble for Mary. Don't you know it caused trouble in the village she lived in? And even among her own family, I'm sure they couldn't understand it because she couldn't understand it. It caused trouble at his birth, if you'll remember. He couldn't be born uh, in, in a normal place. He had to be born in a stable uh, in Bethlehem. According to prophecy, he was born in Bethlehem. It caused trouble with Herod, if you'll remember that. Herod got so afraid that he wanted to kill all the children uh, 18 months old, uh, old and younger. It caused trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The scribes who knew the scripture uh, in, in, in implicitly knew that the child was to be born in Bethlehem, but not one scribe ever went out to Bethlehem to see if it was true. It caused trouble with them. It, it caused upheaval in the whole religious system in Israel. It caused trouble. It caused trouble for Joseph and Mary because they had to run down to Egypt to avoid uh, Herod's sword, if you will. It caused trouble for them. And then they moved back. It caused trouble. He was a man of trouble. Jesus said about that, he said, I didn't come to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring a sword. He can bring peace within, but there's no peace in this earth. And you mention the name of Jesus Christ, and there's trouble. People continue to refuse to believe in him, despite all he is, all he did, all he's doing. There's still trouble in this world. And yet we find the peace of God that passes understanding when we come to him. And so what, what is it about Christmas? Well, when you think about all those names, all of a sudden there's a spiritual gravity, gravitas, if you will, about Christmas. All of a sudden, it makes you and I think about, well, who am I? And 
What is it that uh, God has done? And why did he have to do it the way that he did it? Why did he choose to do that? And then I take a step back and I think, with this great mystery, virgin birth, God man, bringing us to the Father, dying on the cross, being resurrected, all of those things, all I can do is worship Christ with a thankful heart and surrender to him my whole life. We surrender our lives to the mystery of Christmas, the mystery of godliness, for it's great. We come and surrender in faith to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thanking him for being in us, Emmanuel. Thanking him for saving us from our sins, Jesus. Thanking him for being Messiah. Thanking him for being Lord to rule over the whole world and to bring us in his plan, both for now and through death and finally in eternity. Thanking him for that. To trust him and to follow him, to deny ourselves and to follow him because he is the Lord Christ. And then to make Christ known to everyone you can. No matter the response. The response uh, to, to the gospel is a person's uh, own doing. It's, it's a person's responsibility. Our responsibility is to make Christ known in the way we live, in the way we serve, in the message we proclaim, and to make him known as far and wide as we can. The impetus for us is to witness within and make sure we are surrendered to Christ and then to our families and to our friends and finally to this whole world. The world needs and deserves to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just make that happen. So when we see the names of Christ, we see embedded in those names all the meaning of Christmas. Now, if we start there, then all the rest of it makes sense and brings much joy and pleasure in this Christmas season. When you see a light or a tree illuminated, or maybe shrubbery and illuminated. Think of Jesus as the light of the world. When you see a Christmas tree, think about the tree we call the cross. When you see presents, think about the gift of God to us. Let everything about Christmas be everything about Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we are reminded of who we are in Christ and who Christ is. To you, only begotten Son, to us, Lord, Messiah, Savior. And may we surrender our lives, denying ourselves, and live and serve you with gladness. And in this season, Father, remember that the gospel is for the world. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a delight to be with you today. I hope your Christmas season is great. Uh, I know it will be, but don't forget the names of Christ. It'll help us focus upon that true meaning of Christmas and how great God's love is. Until next week, God bless you, and we'll be right here next week with a more, another Christmas message. Until then, God bless you and keep you.